Well, good morning. morning. How is everybody doing this morning? How many of y'all watched the dogs win yesterday? Let me see your hand. How many of you watched another team? Bunch of sinners. All right. Where is uh, Jacob Brewer at? Jacob, would you put your hand up? Are you in here? He's in the back somewhere. You introduced him as a good-looking man, and I was just your friend. And, and that, that bothers me um, because I, I think I'm good-looking. Um, <laughs> he got me on that one. It, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 1 through 12 this morning, and Brian, I like to move around a lot. I hope that's okay, uh, because I'm not a type of person that can just sit still. Uh, I've got to be moving, and I've been like that since I was a young man. Um, But when Brian asked me to to come speak here today, first off, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Let me get that out of the way. Uh, This is a great-looking crowd. Y'all have been extremely friendly to me. And uh, Brian, I appreciate you sharing your pulpit. I know that's a, that's a large deal for somebody to do, and, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but as we started discussing what, what it was he wanted me to talk about, it's the Who's Your One campaign. And, and as I've done more research upon this, because I've already done the, gone through this at our church a little bit, and uh, as I've done more research on it, the one thing I have found regarding the Who's Your One campaign is it's about evangelism. It's about us reaching the lost in the community around us. And, and this is what I've learned. If we don't get intentional about evangelizing the lost, we'll never see the lost come to Christ. I'm going to repeat that statement. If we do not get intentional about evangelizing the lost, then we will never see them come to Christ. If I were to poll you this morning and ask you by a show of hands, who who thinks it is wonderful when you see somebody receive Jesus, then I would hope that every hand in this building would get. I'm not going to because every hand might not, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. Uh, But ultimately, as believers in Christ, that should be our main objective, is to see others come to Christ. Now, when I started examining Scripture, trying to find a passage of Scripture that goes along with this, there are numerous times in Scripture where we see this occur. You see it in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. As Philip's traveling down the roadside and there's a eunuch sitting on a chariot and he's reading, he's reading from the prophet Isaiah as a lamb before its, uh, before its shear is silent, so is the son of man. And, and he says, who is he talking about? And, and, the, and Philip speaks up at that moment and says he's speaking of Jesus and the word of God actually says in Acts chapter 8 that beginning at that point, Philip preached Jesus to this man. Well, here we find a situation of a paralytic. It's a man who needed Christ far more than probably than you or I have. He needed not only a spiritual healing, but a physical healing. And we see them bring Jesus, or bring him to Jesus, and and I want us to pay attention to the friends in this story. What is it that they're actually doing? Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning, and I'm going to ask... If you're physically able, would you mind standing for the reading of the Word of God? Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Is this pulpit mic on? Because I'm going to switch to it. It's not. Okay, I'll keep going like this. Okay. Verse number 1 of chapter 2 of the book of Mark, he says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Verse 3, And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. In verse number 6, And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. And he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven to you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And then verse 12, I want you to pay attention to this. Immediately. He arose, took up his bed, he went out in the presence of them all, 
so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I pray as we leave here today that we would say this very same thing. We've never seen anything quite like this. God, I pray that you would use me in a mighty way right now. Lord, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that does not know you as Savior, I pray that the conviction would lay upon their heart and that they would change before you, they leave here today, Father. Lord, we give you this service. Father God, I give you myself, and I ask that you would use me as your vessel. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So the question arises in life oftentimes, when was your greatest day? What's the greatest thing you've ever been through? The, the, the coolest experience, so to speak, in young terms, I guess. I'm, I'm not hip, okay? I, I know that. Uh, and I'm cool with that. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, December 16th, 1980, the Cab County Hospital. There was a woman named Melinda Thomas that was in labor for almost 20 hours with a young boy. He was a month premature, but he was still 7 pounds, 10 ounces. All of a sudden at 9.30 at night, y'all, check this out. The skies opened up. The clouds parted. A light beam from heaven shone down on that hospital room. And the fourth child of the Thomas clan came into the world. I was born, right? That, that's a pretty cool day. There's great days that happen all around us. Think about another one. Uh, May of 1999, I graduated high school. Something I never thought I would ever do. And my parents thought the same thing. I was not a good student. I, I'm just being honest, y'all. I graduated high school with a D average. I'm not joking. I really did. A D average. I would beat my kids with a brick stick if they came home with a D average. That's just the way that is. But I graduated high school. I got to walk across the stage at Adams Stadium at DeKalb County and receive a diploma. And I graduated from Tucker High School. And I, I don't know where that thing is to this day. I've lost it. But nonetheless, that was a good day. Or January 24th of 2007, let me backtrack one more. If I don't say this one, I get in trouble later on. Uh, <laughs> March 13th of 2004, 15 years ago, my wife and I walked across the stage together and said, I do. And I'm going to tell you all something. I wish she could have been here with me today. She's pretty. Now, you would have said she was pretty. I'm just, that's just the way that is. But, but she's a good-looking woman, and she actually said yes to me when I asked her to marry me. I was shocked, shocked. I said, will you marry me? She said, yes, and I already had the, you know, I was like, well, that's all right. I'll just say, whoa, wait a second. What would you say? <laughs> we getting married. I was excited. Uh, January 24th, 2007, I'm late, and we're in a hospital room in Snellville, Georgia, and I'm holding this little baby boy and looking down at him, and I said, what every dad wants to say to his kid when he's born. Y'all ready? You ready to go fishing, little buddy? <laughs> that's what I said. But that's the truth. That's exactly what I said to him. And, and he smiled, and I said, this is it. You know, this is what life is about. December 16th, my 30th birthday. Athens, Georgia. Athens Regional Hospital. It was a snowy morning, 2010. It was, there was ice on the ground. Nobody could get to the hospital that day. But we were there, and we had another baby. And my little girl, my, my oldest daughter, came into the world. How about May 18th of 2015? Y'all notice I got a lot of kids, okay? May 18th of 2015, Anna came into the world, my, my, my other daughter. Beautiful. And in 2016, November, yeah, those two were close together. I get it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Robert, he's a bullfrog. He came into the world. And we got to love on him. But guys, out of all the days I've had, and I mean, I've had some great days. December 15th, 2015, I graduated from seminary. After not thinking I would ever get through high school, I, I got a master's degree. They were crazy. If y'all want a master's degree, go to Fort Worth, Texas, and they'll just give you one if you pay them enough money. That's the way. <laughs> that's the way that, that is not really how that works. I promise you, there's a lot of hard work involved in that. But, but nonetheless, there has been some pretty awesome days that have occurred in my life. I've, I've seen some pretty neat things. Being able to have kids, that is, to me, that's way up here, right? That, that's just amazing. Well, after my son was born, my first son, Noah, after he was born and I held him in the hospital and I told him those words, you know, you want to go fishing, I sat there and I looked at him that night and I thought, God, you love me this much, this much, not just to make me a dad, not just to make me a father for the first time, but to take your little boy, and say, you know what, here he's yours. You can have him. And to give him to the world. 
so that we all could live eternally. And, and I went, oh, my goodness. And see, at this point in my life, I was a Sunday school teacher. I, I was leading Bible studies in my home. I knew the Bible, y'all. And I'm looking at him, and for the first time, I realized what the love of God truly looked like in the eyes of that little boy. So I went home, and I started doing some soul searching, and I was actually studying that summer because I was going to teach the kids how vital the Lord's Supper is. Y'all know the Lord's Supper where you get the grape juice. In the Baptist church, we use Welch's and crackers, right? And some churches, it depends on where you're at. Either they use those stale ones from Lifeway or oyster crackers. It just depends. Uh, but nonetheless, I knew what that was all about, but I wanted to study the Lord's Supper, so I went to 1 Corinthians, and I started reading what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and I realized how we need to cleanse our hearts before we partake. So before the Lord's Supper occurred, the preacher had just got done preaching, and he gave an altar call, and an altar call to Lord's Supper, there might be maybe a half a person that goes down, right? Well, buddy, I went down. <laughs> altar call came, I went straight to the altar, I got on my knees, and I said, God, what is it? Talk to me. What is it? What is, what is it that's keeping me from you? And he said, you don't know me. I said, yes, I do. He said, read, <laughs> read a little further, son. You don't know me. I said, God, I know you. And he said, no, not everyone who stands before me cries out, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I said, but God, I've led people to Christ. And he said, but people have casted out demons in my name that still don't know me. And I said, whoa. And I gave my life to Christ at that moment. Shortly after that, I was called to, to, to ministry, and then we moved to Texas for seminary, and the rest is, so to speak, history. But this passage, this, this passage of Scripture has been pivotal in my life, and there's a reason for that. Because in my life, this has revealed to me how important it is for us to evangelize. I was always this person. Y'all ready for this? And Some of y'all in here may be this person. I was always this person. Don't ask me to share the gospel. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. Don't ask me to share the gospel. That's somebody else's job. And I realized that that is not what the Word of God tells us. The Word of God tells us that every believer is an evangelist. Do y'all realize that? Every single one of us has a job to do. And if we plan on overtaking this world, which is what our goal is, I hope, if we plan on overtaking this world, then we have to do it by way of the cross. If you think back, think back 18 years ago, this particular Sunday, would there be empty seats in these pews? 18 years ago, this particular Sunday, would there be empty seats in the pews? No. Every church house in the nation was slapped full. People were hitting their knees. They were praying to a mighty holy God, and they recognized the evil that had taken place upon our people. And they said, God, I mean, essentially we were humbling ourselves before God, right? Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek their face, or seek my face, and cry out, then I will hear them from heaven, and I will heal their land. And that's what was happening. But somewhere along the line, something shifted. Somewhere along the line, something changed. Somewhere along the line, we lost sight of Christ. And we started putting ourselves back in, those, in that position. In the book of Mark, we see a situation unfolding here. Where Jesus had come back to Capernaum, this was his home station. Now, if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw it out for you. I don't have one, so I won't. I'll just kind of illustrate. You have the Sea of Galilee that runs around. Tiberius is down here. you got Capernaum up here near Galilee, the city itself. And what would happen was Jesus would travel all the way around, but this was his home spot. Capernaum was his home base. This is where Peter's mother-in-law lived. And as a matter of fact, there are many theologians that would say this house that this took place in was at Peter's mother-in-law's house. So you've got this whole situation where Jesus is traveling, he's healing, he's, he's making the, the, the lame to walk and the blind to see, and he's doing all these miracles and he's attracting a crowd, right? You, you think about how big of a crowd the Savior of the world would attract if he were performing miracles in Gainesville, Georgia. Let me ask you that. Uh, let me ask it to you this way. If, if George Strait was leading worship here this morning, would y'all be able to fit the folks in here? Hold on a second. Why not? 
Because George Strait, we called him King George when I lived in Texas. George Strait is the ultimate country music artist, right? Everybody knows who George Strait is. Everybody wants to hear George Strait. If he were headlining at Martin Baptist Church up at my church next Sunday morning, I'm telling you, there would be people lined up down Highway 17 just to get in and get a piece in them. But here's the problem. At churches across America this morning, King Jesus is headlining, and nobody wants to come. But nobody wants to come because they're not being invited. Nobody wants to come because we're not being intentional in what we need to do. And I say we big time because I'm as guilty as anybody on this particular situation. So we noticed that Jesus had come back to Capernaum. The first thing, if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing I want you to write down is this. Jesus was in the house. Jesus was in the house. How does that look? It says, and again he entered Capernaum, and after some days it was heard that he, speaking of Jesus, was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. So what was Jesus doing in this house? Jesus, as I stated a moment ago, had been going around and he had been traveling and, and performing miracles by the roadside and, and drawing this crowd, and everywhere he went there seemed to be a crowd, right? It always seemed to be a multitude, whether it be up on the mountain and all of a sudden he's got to speak to all these people that are hungry and then he's got to feed them too, or, or whether it be at a house in Capernaum. But so many people would come into this house that you couldn't fit anything else in there. They just wanted to get near the feet of the Savior. It says in there that he was preaching the word to them. Now, what was this word that Jesus was preaching? Because in today's term, if I say I'm preaching the word, I'm reading from stories of Jesus or letters of Paul or John. What was it that Jesus was preaching? Well, I believe John chapter 1 kind of solidifies that for us. When it says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. When it says that Jesus was preaching the word, I believe that Jesus was preaching himself to the people. He knew that there was no other message that they needed to hear rather than salvation. He knew that these people needed to convert to Christianity. He knew that they needed to see the truth that was found within the coming Messiah. He knew that they needed to see the truth that was found outside of the Pharisees, outside of the Sadducees, outside of the scribes, outside of the temple, outside of the legalism, outside of all these things that we had put before God. He said, no. I'm bigger than that. So he traveled around. He gets to his home base, and he goes inside of this house. And when he gets there, people just start piling in. That's not a bad problem to have, is it? When you think about that, that's not a bad problem to have. Imagine having a Bible study in your home and 30 or 40 people showing up to it. And not just 30 or 40 people, 30 or 40 hungry people. So we live in a world that's lost, dying, and going to hell. They're hungry for the truth. The problem is, far too often we put it off on other people to tell them the truth. Now, wait a second. God's the one that put us in their path. And if God put me in their path, who am I to say, no, God, I'm not going to do your work? So we've got the situation unfolded. We know that there was this house and that people were packed in. And the second thing we'll notice is that a man was in need. A man was in need. In verse 3 it says, And they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So examining the term paralytic, this is a person who is paralyzed. They cannot do for themselves. He was 100% reliant on everyone around him. And honestly, they didn't have the technology that we have today. In today's society, yes, being a paralytic is still bad, but it's not quite as bad. We have motorized wheelchairs. We have ways of getting people around, right, and ways of helping them do. At this time, they didn't have any of that. So you have a man who was in need, but he was in such need that he had to rely on his friends for everything in his life. If he needed to go to the restroom, his friends had to help him. When it was time for him to go to the store, somebody had to do it for him. Preparing meals had to be done for him. This man could not do 
for himself. And guys, he is a perfect example of what is happening in the world around us. These people are lost. They don't know any better. It is so easy for us to point our fingers at the world around us and say, oh, you bunch of sinners, you're allowing this to happen or you're allowing that to happen or this law is passed and that law is passed and this and this and this. Guys, listen to me. They don't know any better. They don't. The other day I had somebody ask me, preacher, why in the world does the world that we live in, why has it turned so evil? And my response is because the church has been asleep. We have not spoken up. We have not spoken out. And in many situations, we've just rested to the fact that this is the way the world is and there's nothing I can do about it. And you're exactly right. This is the the way the world is and there is nothing you can do about it. But there is something that he can do about it. And in order for him to do the something about it that he needs to do, you have to be willing what he's calling you to do. When I say this man was in need, he was in need of a miracle. He was in need of a miracle. His friends had paid attention to what was happening throughout Jesus' ministry. They saw the healing that was taking place. Word had gotten out. People were talking in Jerusalem, y'all. They were excited about what was happening. This man, he was charismatic, he was young, he was coming in, he was healing people, and they were so excited. So his friends see that Jesus comes to town and they say, hang on a second, Bob can't walk, let's get him there. So they go over to the pallet in which Bob was laying. Now when it says bed, it wasn't a a Simmons mattress, right? This was a pallet that he was laying on. It would have been like a stuffed out blanket probably. And so they grab the four corners of that pallet, they throw it up over their shoulder, and they march him straight through town, right to the house where Jesus was at. And when they got there, they found out that there was no room. These men could have very easily said, okay, we see how it is. Buddy, you're just going to have to wait until he's in town next time and moved on with life. But they didn't. They looked around, and the way these houses were constructed at this time, they were, they were essentially a square with a flat roof. The reason the roof was flat is that's where they would go to get away because these houses were stacked right on top of each other, one after another. The, the, the pathways between them wasn't this wide. You know, I, I grew up in, in Tucker, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, right? And, and so our houses were kind of close together. And I don't like that. We, call, we could pass a cup of sugar between houses almost, you know? I don't like living that close to somebody, and neither did they. So they flattened out the top of their roof, and they made the roofs out of this tile construction. They would take thatch and mud and sticks and put it all together and and make these tiles, and then they'd carry them up to the roof of the house and set them into place, and they had these long beams going across that they would set in, kind of like a drop ceiling but in reverse, right? Kind of like a drop ceiling. So, So these things were these big old thick, heavy, big pieces of tile, and they had to support the weight of the people because this is where they would do their sunbathing. You remember uh, David and Bathsheba, right? He looked out, she was sunbathing on top of her house. This is the type of construction she would have been working with there. And so when they got to the house and they see that there's no room inside, there's no way to get Bob in through the front door, they look and there's a ladder leaned up against the back of the house. And one of them gets that bright redneck idea. That's what I love about it. You know these were a bunch of rednecks, right? He, he gets this bright idea, and he goes, hang on a second, y'all. We can get Bob inside this house, but we got to go up first. They said, what do you mean? And he said, well, there's a ladder out back. And we've got to get Bob up on the roof of the house, and if we do, then we can break the tiles out from the ceiling and lower him down. And, and they were dumb enough to say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. And you can imagine whoever the homeowner was, what they must have felt as all these people were in the house and then all of a sudden the the ceiling starts to crumble and you look up and there's this guy laying, coming down as a paralytic. He He can't move and he's coming down to the feet of Jesus. But here's the thing with that. This man's friends were doing whatever it took to get him underneath the teaching of God. They did whatever it took to get him under the preaching of the Word of God, according to what Mark was saying, Jesus was preaching the Word to them. They did whatever it took to allow the healing to take place in their friend's life. 
And church, I'm here to tell you, I pray to God that it becomes our mission that we'd be willing to tear the roof off of every church in America to get somebody underneath the preaching of the Word of God. This is the point we must get to. This is how we make evangelism intentional. This is how we share the gospel with others. What are you willing to do to get somebody to Jesus? If somebody's sick, you take them to the doctor. If your car needs service work, you take it to the mechanic. If you're hungry, you go to the grocery store. If you're out of money, you go to work or the bank. We have somewhere we go for everything in life. But yet when it comes to our relationship with Christ, our generations before us and even some of our own generation has taught us that there's two things you don't talk about in life. Politics and religion. And as long as we don't talk about those two things, we won't upset anybody and everybody will be fine. As a 38-year-old young man, I know I'm young, I get that, father of four kids, yada, yada, yada. I'm here standing before you today, and I'm telling you that's hogwash. It's time for us to put political correctness aside and tell people the truth. And if we can't do that, then we can't do anything. So we see that there was a man in need, and I know in your mind right now, you're probably thinking about somebody in your life, right? Who is it in your life that's in need like this man? Who is it that you know that's lost? Is it a cousin? Is it an aunt? Is it an uncle? A co-worker? A friend? A son? A daughter? A mom? A dad? Who is it? Who's that one person right now that God is laying upon your heart and he's telling you it's your job to make sure they hear? It's your job to make sure they know the truth. Listen, and in many situations, making sure they hear and making sure they know the truth is simply bringing them to someone who can tell them, right? In other situations, it's for you to tell them. There might be an event coming up that you can say, hey, I know I'm going to hear the gospel at this event. Why don't you come to it? I had a young man two weeks ago, we had a B-Shock concert. Now, this is a Christian rapper, y'all. I, I don't like Christian rap a whole lot. And I, I messed up, and I told him that on the telephone when we were talking about doing the event. I said, man, I, I love you, and I love, my kids love your music. And he said, what about you? And I said, I'd rather not comment on that. And, and he said, why? And I said, because it's just not my style, but the kids love it. There was one, one man in particular named, I, we'll just call him Daryl, Okay. And Daryl, we have been praying for Daryl. We've been trying to get Daryl to come to church. Daryl won't come to nothing. Y'all know people like that. You say, hey, buddy, would you please come? Nah, I'm good. And then you tell him about Jesus, and he says, I just, you know, I live my life right, and I hope that God sees that, and yada, yada, yada. When we had that B-Shock concert, Daryl likes rap music, so guess who showed up? Daryl. Guess who got saved? Daryl. Y'all see what I'm saying? Just because it's something that might not fit your agenda or your criteria or meet your needs doesn't mean it's not going to meet somebody else's. This man was in need, just like our friends and family are. This man was in need worse than most people around us. And God offered healing. God offered healing. That's the third and final point. I love it when a Baptist preacher says that. That means y'all will be out of here by 1 o'clock probably. I'll try and get you out soon. God offered healing. Now, the, the healing was offered in two different parts. The first part we see is in verse number 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, here's the thing regarding that. That, I don't think, is the reason why these four guys were carrying this man to Jesus. They, they weren't expecting a spiritual healing. They wanted the second healing to take place. But see, Jesus knew within his heart, because he's God, that a spiritual healing was more important. That an eternity was at stake here. And he looked directly at the man and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, after this took place, you know what happened. <laughs> People don't like that. They got to talking, y'all. 
The scribes and Pharisees, they got to talking. They started running their mouths and they said, He's a blasphemer. Who can forgive sins but God alone? This man is not God. There is no way that he can forgive sins. And so Jesus spoke up, he stepped in, and he said, I tell you what, y'all don't believe I can do this, but so that you know I have the power to, here's what's going to happen. And if you look at the end of the chapter, verse number 10 and on, he says, but that you may know the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your home. Now, what Jesus did not say is, Arise, take up your bed, and have somebody drive you over to the rehab center because you've got to learn how to walk now. Uh, uh, arise, take up your bed. Here's a pill you've got to take three times a day. Right? That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your home. And then verse 12, you look, and it says that the man, immediately he arose. I can see him walking down the streets of Capernaum right now, y'all. Can you imagine this? Being paralyzed and not being, not having no hope whatsoever. Scared to death. You can't even do for yourself. And a man tells you, I want you to get up, take up your bed, and go home. And groggy feeling probably, you can imagine. He started going, oh, I'm tired. And he gets up and he grabbed that bed up. And he went, whoa. Wait a second. You'd think he'd look like a newborn baby deer, right? Dance like Elvis. Uh -huh. But instead, he got up, and he walks out the door carrying this pallet, this bed that he had been laying on. And I can see him now running through town, looking like Dick Van Dyke from Mary Poppins, doing the heel click in the air and all these other things. So excited about what God had just done, going, hey, y'all, look at me. And people sitting in shop windows going, hey, ain't that Bob? Look, I saw him the other day. He was laying at home. What's he doing walking? But guys, that's what the power of God looks like. Let me explain this to you for a moment. The ultimate healing that this world that we live in needs is a healing of eternal magnitude, of salvation. There is a learning curve with salvation. Y'all do get that, right? Somebody gets saved, you can't expect them just to boom, change. But here's what I see so often in my life. When people get saved, guess what happens? Boom, they change. Here's why. If I were to walk across the street right now and not look both ways, kids don't do that, but if I were to walk across the street and not look both ways, and let's say there was a dump truck loaded down, a Mack truck coming down the hill, and that thing hit me and knocked me to the ground and ran over me and kept on going and I lived. Let me ask you a question. Do you think there will be evidence of that encounter with that Mack truck 10 years from now? Yeah. I'd have, man, and I told somebody this the other day, I would hope if that happened that I'd have a scar that ran from here and zigzag all the way down my face, and I could get those cool wide stitches put in, and that way I'd just have, and people would say, what happened? I'd say, I got bit by a shark, you know, or something like that. But, but nonetheless, I would have scars on me, right? I'd walk with a limp. There would be evidence that I had an impact with something great. But far too often, we have an encounter with the creator of the universe. Not just an encounter. A life-changing experience. Because, see, here's the difference. I get hit by that Mack truck. It's an external impact, and that thing leaves me alone from then on. I'm scared of trucks for the rest of my life, but it's an internal impact. But, buddy, once you get saved, once Christ Jesus enters into your heart and into your life, so does the Holy Spirit, and he don't leave. So from that moment forward, not only is it an external impact, it's an internal impact, and it's an eternal impact, and it's something that should shine through me for the rest of my life. There should be a change. You go back to my greatest day ever. That day sitting at the altar, I finally realized, God, I've got to have you. And there was a thought that entered into my mind. And I've realized this to be truer the older I get. It's not enough for me to know Jesus. Let me reiterate that statement, and I want all of you to listen to me on this. It's not enough for me to know Jesus. It's not. The book of James says even the demons know who he is, and they tremble at the fear of his name. 
Here's the kicker. He's got to know me. My fear is that he'll look at me and say, Depart from me, worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. My hope is that he'll say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. When I look at my own life and I see what Christ has done in and through me, I'm grateful. I'm eternally grateful. But guys, I mess it up every day. Every single day I do something that's dumb. Would y'all believe that? I'm a very intelligent person in my own mind. <laughs> Listen, I thought I made a mistake about five years ago. Y'all know what I found out? I was mistaken. I, I hadn't made a mistake. I, I'm perfect. That's what we all like to think of ourselves. The truth is we're all miserable, miserable wretches without Christ. There is nothing good in me other than him. And I'm so grateful for the love that he displays to me. And I'm so grateful for the fact that just as this paralytic was lowered down through the roof, through the ceiling tiles, that I was saved. And, and here's the thing. When I think about my salvation experience, when I think about the day that somebody invested in me enough to say, no, this young man needs Jesus, there are names that come to mind. David Sharpton's one of them, associate pastor at Maysville Baptist Church. David poured into me more than anybody else in my life. Brian Stowe, who was the pastor at the, that church at that time. My dad. Whoo! Godliest man I know. One of the best looking too. I look just like him. But, but he, he's the godliest man I know. My dad poured into me from a young child the gospel, making sure that I knew the truth. If you think back upon your salvation experience, you should be able to think of that person too. Do you got them in your mind? Think about it for a moment. Who is it that played a pivotal role in you receiving Christ? Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, a school teacher, a mom, a dad, a spouse, a child. You got them in your mind? If you do, shake your head, yeah. If you're thinking about that person, shake your head, yeah. Wouldn't you like to be that person for somebody else? If it hadn't have been for the David Sharpens of the world, I wouldn't be saved. If it hadn't been for the Terry Thomases of the world, I wouldn't have heard the gospel when I heard it, and I would not have come to Christ at that time. I think about those things. God had a bigger plan than I ever thought of. But it was because there were men and women who were willing to allow God to use them. And the question I've got for you today is, would you allow God to use you? In order to allow God to use you, there's something that must take place first. You, you have to kind of have this thing called a relationship with him. This is what cracks me up. People, people get saved and they, they get, say a prayer and they get baptized and then you ask them about their prayer life and they're reading the Bible. Oh, I don't need to do all that. I'm saved. I don't need to go to church. I'm saved. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I've been counseling married couples for 10 years now. and One of the key things I'm taught is that, that the key to a relationship is, is one word. Can anybody tell me what it is? Communication. I see many of you mouthing it. Communication. If we don't talk, we don't have a relationship, right? If I live at home with my wife and all I do is pass her in the hallway every day and I don't even speak to her, I have no relationship with my spouse. I want to tell you something. It's the same thing with God. There is no relationship if you don't communicate. But the first step to that is making sure that he knows who you are. See, here's the thing about that date in 2007. When I was 14 years old in 1994, it was actually April the 29th, there was a man named J. Harold Smith that was preaching at Rehoboth Baptist Church, and I sat through a two-and-a-half-hour-long sermon. Yeah, he didn't quit. He kept on going. When he got done, man, I got tied in with this wave of people that went up to the front of the church, and I, I prayed, and I, I said this prayer, and I said, God, I want you to come into my life, and I want you to save me. And then the next day, I went, next Sunday, I got baptized, and there was never a change in my life. There was never anything that changed. I had every bit of my trust in this prescribed prayer that I had been told, if you pray this, you'll be saved, right? And it scared me. It wasn't until that 2007 date that I finally realized, God, I need you. I can't do this life without you. I've tried. I mess everything up. I mess things up royally. I'm not, whoo. But God, I need you to step in and, and perform miracles. And he did. This morning, I want to tell you something. He can perform the same miracles in your life as well. 
People say that salvation is a free gift of God. There's nothing required of man. I beg to differ. There is one thing required of man. One thing. Acceptance. Uh, you can offer me a Christmas present and me go, no thanks, and walk away from it. So it's not my present until I receive it. And today I want to tell you, Christ is offering you salvation just like he did to this paralytic. He wants to tell you your sins are forgiven of you, but you have to be willing to receive it. So this morning, right where you're sitting, if everybody would bow your head and close your eyes for just a few moments, I promise I'm, I'm finishing up right now. As we think about that, what does it look like for us to receive Christ? Maybe you're that person. Maybe you're like I was. At some point in time or another in your life, you said a prayer or you got baptized or you did this or this or this, and you've gone through life thinking, you know what, I'm saved and I'm good. But this morning, God is revealing to you, you know what, you're not. You're living a lie. Maybe this morning you just want to settle it, whatever that looks like.